joining us uh, today. What we have today is a lesson out of history. What my interest in this event is, as uh, a great person once said, uh, uh, Charles de Gaulle used to say, you cannot take any intelligent decision without looking at history and geography. And he had on his desk books of, of, of history and all of his walls, and I had the honor of visiting his office, he had on the walls maps of the world. And he said, without geography and history, you go wrong. So what we have here today is something to learn from. That is why I think it's an important uh, uh, event. I want you to know that we are now on the air. It is uh, on Talal Abu Ghazali uh, FM station. We are live uh, on broadcasting. And uh, also that we will be producing uh, a press release which we will circulate to be carried uh, all over the news agencies. My chief uh, media advisor, head of, uh, and my uh, media representative worldwide will uh, take care of the, of the process. Uh, we are lucky. I was just telling the ambassador that uh, you have joined us this week, uh, Mr. Khaled Dalal, after serving six years as head of media at the Royal Court. We are very honored uh, that you have accepted to join us. Um, the, now, uh, what we would like to do is uh, r realize that uh, we, we are uh, uh, um, interested in this because it is part of our history as much as it is part of the Hungarian history. This is a joint, like many events, or important events in the world, they are joint events, joint historic events. And we have a lot to learn from, uh, from what happened uh, in, this, in this very important and uh, critical era we are about to, to hear about. So thank you, Your Excellency, for choosing uh, this place, this Talal Abu Ghazali Knowledge Forum, to be the venue for this presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, all. Thank you so much, Dr. Tala, for hosting us here uh, with another beautiful uh, example of uh, uh, growing cooperation between Hungary and, uh, and your organization. I'd like to thank you and all your colleagues who participated and uh, contributed to this afternoon's events. I'd also like to welcome Professor Sakai and his team uh, from the Veritas History. Um, Institute from Budapest, and I'd like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us on this uh, very interesting uh, book presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, 1956 was a momentous year. If you think back of your history here in Jordan, the young King uh, Hussein was um, um, trying to consolidate and start his rule with very important decisions that year. For us Hungarians, 1956 started almost as a year of hope, and then it became very complex. And I, I think um, part of this complexity will, will be discussed here today uh, during the, the presentation. Um, uh, as most of you remember, we marked, marked the 60th anniversary of, um, of the revolution just last October, uh, including here in Amman with a, a special um, a concert and exhibition, and so many of you joined, we were honored. And then I was thinking of what the legacy of our revolution in 1956 must be today, 60 years later. And I would point out that I could identify at least twofold, two main legacies. One is that um, the Hungarian people proved then, again, that pluralistic democracy and freedom are core values and we don't like to compromise on these. 
and these were the simple demands, but so complicated too, and, and didn't achieve until more than 30 years later. Um, the other legacy was that the revolution in 1956 put Hungary on the map. If we travel from Australia to Canada and all across Europe, we meet the representatives of those that generations who will tell us the first time I heard about Hungary was in 1956. We were surprised to learn that there was a nation, uh, Hungary, behind the Iron Curtain, and they were rebelling against, against the mighty Russian Empire. And, of course, those were just the start of, of, of tele televised broadcasts, so when the news came in printed and, uh, and wires and, and radio, but they were following these unbelievable events from behind the Iron Curtain. And there is this generation in so many countries in the world whose, whose memory carries this as one of the first formative experience of, of, of the then young adults. And then later they met um, the Hungarian uh, uh, refugees as they started to arrive in their countries. And these uh, refugees, ladies and gentlemen, more than 200,000 of them form uh, from New Zealand to, to Canada. Um, the, the core of the Hungarian community, expat community, or Amigri community uh, that we know. Um, so for us it was a formative year, but as we know, no historic event is taking place in its own. There is always a, 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 con, a, a, a context. As Dr. Tala pointed out, history, uh, history and geography might jointly offer a lot of explanations. And there is also such a thing as geographical determination. Uh, in, in this sense, Hungary is in a very sensitive middle of Europe because between east and west, north and south, it's a strategic um, location, not by the size, by, uh, but by the uh, uh, by the position of the country. I was telling Dr. Dr. Gazar that, that the withdrawing German troops, for instance, during the Second World War, were fighting some of their last serious battles. Um, and this is why Hungary suffered a lot. There was a lot of damage done, including in Budapest, which also almost spared uh, cities like uh, Vienna and Prague, because there it was only withdrawing, uh, giving up all uh, armed resistance. And so, the, uh, this is why I'd like to thank and congratulate the team of the Veritas Institute that they took the effort to walk around a little bit of what we know from, from our Hungarian perspective about the revolution. Uh, but there was so much happening parallelly with that, very important things which had a big in imprint on this region, for instance, and it created a new reality actually in this region after the Suez um, campaign. And so I think um, 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 uh, um, uh, portraying, introducing the, the, the parallels and the connections is truly a, an important mission and I'm, I'm very happy and thank you that you brought the results of this research here to Amman, and uh, I would like to pass the word to the uh, Director General of the Veritas Historic Institute from Budapest, Dr. Shandor Sakai. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I would like to say my English is very bad. It's in very interesting. I was a student in 1970 and I made an English course. It was perhaps a six months in English, uh, in Utrecht College. I understand some things, but I don't know, uh, speak and make some uh, mistakes. But I have a friend and colleagues from Budapest, and he will uh, speak about the Veritas Historical Research Institute and about this book. This book, I think it's a very uh, interesting and very important book about the Hungarian Revolution and Freedom Fight or Freedom Fighter uh, Revolution in Hungary. Uh, Tembos uh, said, it is a very important thing 
in the, in the 20th century in Europe, and I think not in Europe, perhaps, perhaps, uh, perhaps in all the world. And uh, there is very uh, interesting, and uh, it's uh, for us, for Hungarian, uh, it is, was too difficult to think what was here in the Arabic uh, uh, states and what's happened in the, in the Suez. And we have some friends here in, in Jordanian, perhaps, and in other, other countries. And we have some uh, papers. It was uh, translated for Hungarian, from Cairo, from Moscow, and, and uh, other, other uh, countries and uh, cities. And uh, it's interesting. It is between Suez and Budapest in 1965, uh, in, in 1956. Uh, uh, problem or not, it was for the world the same problem or not, and uh, we made this book, and this book have an English and Arabic introduction. Introduction, mm -hmm. I think you can read it, but uh, the original uh, source is in in Arabic. Perhaps it was translated. We have in Hungarian any any colleagues uh, there speak very good uh, Arabic too. And I hope it's between the Hungarian and uh, between the Jordanian people and, and friends. It's a, a very uh, good thing. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I would like to give for you these books, the four books, yes. And can I say this about the Hungarian music? I, I think. I, I wish I could speak. <laughs> Uh, Hungarian <laughs> like you speak English. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Your thank English you very much. is excellent. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. You know, I... I <laughs> yes, the, uh, the Pritala, a little surprise mm. for you. Yes, a little surprise Ah, but... Uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, and, uh, so. and I think it's, it's possible perhaps mm -hmm. we can uh, mm -hmm. uh, my colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, Zoltan Devabari, and uh, this is a he little, speak about uh, the uh, institute like and about his book in English and more better as I. Thank you. Which, uh, Thank you very much. Portrays on one side the parliament, on the other side Budapest, uh, with the, the Danube in the middle. The beautiful, <laughs> beautiful Budapest and the beautiful Danube. <laughs> The blue Danube. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dorsan Devavari. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you uh, to the very fast institute after that, our book, uh, which is now here, just only four copies, but I hope uh, for a time uh, you all will be able to have one of them. The government of Hungary created the Heritage Research Institute for History with the explicit goal of studying and evaluating the historical research of Hungary's past 150 years, especially of those historical events generating much debate, but never having released a consensus understanding. We, at Veritas, would like to do this without anger and bias, and based upon new studies of primary searches and basic researches. And what are these themes, events, and episodes on which we shine focus? There are three. The first is the post reconciliation Hungary's social and political evolution and the circumstances leading to the formation of political parties in that era. The led up World War I and the post berlin impact of Hungary and her people. Closely related, it is our second theme, Trianon. 20th century Hungary's greatest tragedy, the bounds of which remains unhealthy even today. The micro shorty associated interval period. The achievements and even of this nearly 25 year period, which are worthy of study and critics. Our third theme is the post war period from 1954, considered the turning point in Hungary's history when the country joined a new world and became a settled state of the communist empire when all 
of the hope for democratic change took place in the name only leading to the collective defense, disappointment of all those who had no place in Marjar Rakushi Angles. To tell the truth, however, there were praise for them as many were subsequently sent to internment camps, to the wretched labor camps, or to some other correctional facilities. Some of them were relocated, losing their home and possession in the process. This brings up the question of whether the Hungarian people passively accepted their plight without a word of protest of what was their resistance. These are the questions to which we must give authentic answers, just as we should not neglect the remember of the events of 1956, which beginning a popular uprising over the course of 13 days, with some parts of the country lasting even longer, matured into a full-fledged flight for freedom and became one of the most outstanding in the events of 20th century Hungary. Alas, it took another thir 35 years for the Russian to do to so when in June 1991 the last occupying Soviet troops pulled out of Hungary. For this to happen through the formation of an opposition movement in the 1940s was necessary, as well as the 1998-1990 change in the understanding and coherence of the Joseph Antal threat government. The, at the leadership and the staff of Veritas Research Institute for History believe that no part of Hungarian history should remain shrouded. In light of this commitment, we endeavor to do our work to the best of our ability, both today and in the future. Our nation's wise men, Ferenc Deak, said, one time. Also, the reason why we have chosen his word as our slogan, Thou shalt not lie. Uh, that uh, is, uh, in few words, uh, the main goal of the uh, Veritas Institute. And uh, now let me to introduce our book uh, that will be about 30 minutes. So, on the basis of every research, our vol volume attempts to present the simultaneously occurring event of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution and the Suez Crisis. Legends, myths, speculation, and rumors have surrounded the link between the events of Hungary and Egypt, and the pact between the leadership in Washington and Moscow related to Budapest and Suez and still surround them today. How did the concurrence even in Hungary and Egypt happen? How was the Hungarian Revolution perceived in Egypt in 1956? At the same time, what did the Hungarian think of the Suez crisis? By using published documents, we wish to answer these questions as well as to get insight into Hungary and Egyptian relations and the statements and opinions of the Arab country on the Hungarian events of 1956 and the Suez crisis. Moreover, we will see what attempts were made to resolve the Suez crisis. The published documents also allow us to shed light on the mechanism of international system and the ongoing diplomatic negotiation behind the scenes. The documents of the Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs are stored in the National Archives in Hungary. The documents of the Egyptian Foreign Ministry are to be found in the National Archives of Egypt and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Library in Egypt. Part of the Arabic Arabic documents related to the same subject. In these cases, we choose not to disclose them. We found 34 encrypted cables sent from the Hungarian embassy in Cairo to the Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1956. These we 
public in their integrity and in chronological order. Re we review the foreign effort search issued in 1956 at the National Archive of Hungary concerning Israel, among which we found no document related to this subject. We corrected incidental typographical errors and occasional spelling mistakes as those would have made reading and comprehension significantly feel more difficult. The purpose of our work is not to provide a complete scene analysis of the role in the system that the foreign ministry played in the international power struggle of the time or in the domestic political structure. It is a village at the time within the most closed camp and outside of it the Hungarian Communist Party and government leaders could not deviate from the prevailing, prevailing requirements, not the they wish to. Individual tasks with dealing with international effort were kept within strictly controlled framework. Hungarian diplomats were not granted substantial decision-making freedom. Moreover, they were trusted to handle various other responsibilities. Through so presented as foreign relations to public opinion and diplomatic circles, in reality, what was referred to as diplomacy include numerous state security tasks that serve the interests of not only the homeland, but also the larger government, the highest level leadership in the Hungarian working party, meaning the availability of party. We will abstain from providing the detailed analysis of those constraints. Our study is limited to present, presenting the surviving foreign ministry searches related to the events of Budapest and Suez in autumn 1956. The various extensive subchapters serve as background information on the contents of the search. Thus, the organization of Hungarian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Egyptian Foreign Ministry, the international situation in the years before the Hungarian Revolution, the circumstances in the Middle East and Egypt prior to the Triathlete of Severus, the Triathlete of Severus and its consequences, <coughs> the way the Egyptians view the events in Hungary, and finally, the overall summary. These are all subjects based on the search. If we are looking in the history uh, line, then we must to need or must to see that in pursuit of the death and the leadership of the victorious or great power of Second World War set down to negotiate in Geneva in July 1955. Then two main topics of discussion were the German question and arms reduction. In the Cold War era, the summit proved to be a new milestone on the road to the detente. At the nego negotiations, Eisenhower announced that nations had the right to choose the form of government they wished to live under, and nations deprived of sovereignty and self-determination must have both restored. According to Bulgarian, however, the debate about the government of Eastern Europe was asking to interfere with the domestic efforts of those states. In Cold War logic, arm reduction simultaneously means lessening the deterrent and demining the arms race. The fact that the four great powers sat down to negotiate in Europe was itself a significant event which raised hope of the possibility of East and West moving closer. <coughs> At the summit, despite the disputes and conflicts of interest, the four great powers reinforced Europe division and the borders of their respective paths of influence, thus giving support to the exciting European status quo. 
additional support came on December 14, 1955, when Hungary became a full member of the United Nations. The proposal that came out of the Soviet-American agreement was accepted by the Security Council and 16 countries were able to add to United Nations membership. Both France and Great Britain had lost its pre-Second uh, World War status in the Middle East. In November 1944, under the leadership of Ben Bella, an armed struggle for freedom began in Algeria, for which Egypt provides arms. In 1940, uh, 1947, India became independent. According to the United Nations resolution adopted on November 29th in 1947, London was required been withdrawn its troops from the territory of Palestine mandate by August, by 1st of August 1948. On midnight, 14, uh, on the 14 May 1948, David Ben Gurion proclaimed the establishment of the State of Israel, and the Union Jack was lowered. On the same day, the armed forces of Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon. Syria and Transjordan initiating an attack against Israel. That was the first Arab-Israel war, but the war was underway. Israel would score a military victory and with the United Nations and Mediator, Egypt and Israel began negotiation, the result of which was a ceasefire agreement. As part of the agreement, the Gaza zone were put under Egyptian oversight by the Israelis were a war authority of the Niger Desert and Western Galilee. In April 1950, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan came into existence, which united the eastern half of Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Transjordan. No independent Arab state was set up on the territory of the Palestinian mandate, and with the formation of Israel, almost any mostly between Arabs and Jews depended. Ongoing changes in the Egyptian army force influenced the three officer movement, which set in 22nd July, 22nd and 23rd July in 1952 as the date for revolutionary change. As trained by dawn, the rebels had control of every military in important post. From summer 1952, Egypt was led by Muhammad Naguib, who insisted that every party had to cleanse itself of all current politicians. In June 1953, Naguib announced the establishment of the Republic of Egypt. Gamal Abdel Nasser was appointed Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Defense. He resigned the latter position but in such manner that his confidant and best friend Abdul Hakim Amr was named chief of staff of Egyptian army. Amr purged the officer ranks of Nasser's enemy. On February 23, 1954, Negub resigned from his post as president of the, Repo of the, the, the Republic. His followers were jailed or exiled and Nasser took finally the total power. Since Second World War, uh, since First World War, aspiration for independence had been among the main objectives of Egypt and foreign policy. Egypt relationship with Great Britain was an important political concern. In 1952, British soldiers guarded the Suez Canal. The first significant foreign relation step was the British Egyptian Agreement signed on 12 February 1953 with respect to the future of the Sudan. One month after the takeover negotiations were initiated with Great Britain. Even so, the Sudan chose independence at the end of 1955. Egypt had not yet lost the Sudanese match. The Sudan was one 
was on the road to independence and later would play an independent role in <coughs> Africa. Nasser's goal was to make Egypt sovereign. He wished to create an Egypt free of foreign troops stationed on its land. Additionally, he wanted Egypt to be the leader among the Arab states, successfully lining up the entire Arab world in support of his foreign policy. policy. <coughs> his policy also catalyzed the pursuit of unity among the Arab nation, pan-Arabism. Egypt independent foreign policy had weighed on the international state that Egypt desired to lead a united Arab world kept him from joining any, any military group for taking the leadership role and one was beyond hope. In 1954, unbearable pressure bore down on the government in Cairo because of its anti block stance. In the Sudan, Egyptian influence warned because of the British, whose position was also significantly weakened through a <coughs> To the north, Turkey became an advocate for the Western power. To the east, Iraq announced a military agreement with Turkey, which came to fruition <coughs> in February 1955. In 1954, Nasser worked together with the administration in Washington, which wanted Egypt to join the anti-Soviet bloc and make peace with Israel. Nasser, however, wanted Washington to pressure London to withdraw from the Suez Canal. Nasser and the Americans' cooperation was short and tactical in nature. Egyptian interest dictated the British troops withdraw from the Suez. The British sides had protracted negotiation on the condition of the British pull-out. London, however, insisted that technicians be allowed to remain at the bay. A significant foreign relations that for Nasser was finding the agreement by which the British agreed to leave the Suez Canal. Ratified in October 1954, the entire withdrawal war of Brit British troops would take place within 20 months. In September 1955, Egypt announced that it would purchase $200 million in arms from Czechoslovakia to be paid for in Egyptian ground cotton, whether it would came to light that the actual arm dealer was the Soviet Union. This marked the point when the Arab-Israeli arms race ramped up considerably. France accelerated its arms sale to Israel and accused Nasser of inciting anti-French sentiment in Tunisia, Morocco, and especially in Algeria. The sale also signaled the arrival of the Soviet Union as a major player in the Middle East. Nasser also ignored American objection to the same. Nasser faced another challenge with the November 1955 signing of the Baghdad Pact, Pact which he did not believe was in the best interest of the Arab country. To Nasser, the inclusion of uh, Iraq second most influential Arab country after Egypt meant that the Hashemites in Baghdad and Amman had called into question Egypt's <coughs> superiority and were attempting to undermine Arab solidarity. Meanwhile, making Egypt the dominant player among the Arab countries remained Nasser's goal. The monumental plain which symbolized the rebirth of Egypt was the building of Aswan High Town, which significantly increased arable land accretion and resulted in GDP growth. Prior to 1952, experts believed that building the water reservoirs along the length of the White Nile and its searches would ensure irrigators throughout the year 
for the peasant of the Sudan and Egypt, irrespective of its water level, which was dependent of the Blue Nile. The plan, however, would have made Egypt dependent upon the work in the Sudan. When it became clear that the two countries would not unify, the plan ceased to be in the interests of Egypt. Thus, an alternative plan was placing the dam in Aswan on Egyptian territory, capable of holding an entire year worth of, for, of food water. In order to build it, Nasser needed four inch loan. In December 1955, the World Bank sent its proposal an immediate 200 million loan for the first phase of the construction to be supplemented by 56 million and 40 million in financial aid from the United States and Great Britain respectively. Provide that the Egyptians agreed to the deal they would have to accept the condition of the American-British financial aid package. Western supervision of Egypt's economy, no ad additional arm deal with the Soviet Union, and agreements and contracts with public, and at last the preliminary, preliminary agreement with the Sudan on the Nile water right. From U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dewey's point of view, the world was divided into two types of countries democratic and communist. In other words, there were no neutral countries. He viewed Egypt moving closer to Moscow with oppression and considered it especially ominous when Nasser recognized Red China in 1955. <coughs> On July, on July 1956, Egyptian ambassador Ahmed Hussein confirmed that Nasser was ready to accept Washington's proposal even though it had objectionable condition. The next day, however, Dulles confirmed that the U.S. administration had, in the meantime, retreated the proposal. In response, Nasser announced to a crowd gathered on Liberation Square in Alexandria on July 26th of July that Today we celebrate the fourth anniversary of the revolution, the start of the fifth year of the revolution, after having spent for earthenous and contentious year freeing ourselves from the shameful and long-lasting shadow of the past, the centuries long oppression of colonialism, colonialism the reign of tyranny, and the, the effects of both foreign and domestic exploration. In his speech, Nasser also openly took up the mantle of Arab nationalism in the face of colonial power. More and more Arab nationalism has come to the fore. Arab nationalism is running triumphant. It is gaining ground and clearly no direction of progress. The Arab people know exactly who their friends and enemies are. The Arab people know that their existence depends on their unity and the strength flow from the national feeling. For France, the Suez Canal was the last means through which to influence the Egyptian economy. For the British, it had served as their empire ambition, ambition called during the interval period, resolutely defending it as if their own. The Suez Canal was also strategically important as like part to the east used by United States, Great Britain, France, and the Netherlands crossed Egyptian airspace. In the eyes of the Arabs, Nasser was a national hero who flew in the face of the Western power. The United States main concern were Dofford, the right of shipping to pass through the Suez Channel and what effort Nasser example would have on Panama and its canal. Although company headquarters were located in Paris, 
few Westerners took note that the Suez Channel regularly belonged to Egypt, a fact universally recognized since its competition and reaffirmed by the 1954 British Egyptian Agreement. A standard procedure in international law, the Egyptian government was within its right to nationalize the channel provided the stockholders were compensated. One day after Nasser's speech in Alexandria, the Egyptian ambassador in Budapest announced to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that the Suez Channel had been nationalized, which was followed by the official communique four days later. The Suez development had various repercussions. French and Anglo media, as well as public opinion supporting occupying Egypt and topping Nasser, Nasser before the rest of the of the Arab world line up behind. Neither the British nor the French were in a position to launch an immediate occupation of Egypt to retake the Suez Channel. The President Eisenhower and his Secretary of State believed diplomacy was the means to a solution. France and Great Britain want to play the channel under international observation since the imported oil essential to their economy had to pass through the channel to reach them. A conference was organized to take place in London, but Egypt refused to send delegation. In August, the Egyptian government disclosed that it is considered the proposal to form an international committee as nothing more than an international colonization attempt threat in Nazis. The 18 nations that supported the decision sent the delegation led by Australian Prime Minister to Cairo to convince Nasser, but he was adamant in refusing the idea of international observer. Those proposed creating the Suez Channel Users Association as means to collect channel tools. NASA rejected this idea <coughs> as well, but Egypt shows inclination to continue negotiation. In the meantime, French, British, American and Egyptian diplomats agreed to meet again in Geneva at the end of October to come to a compromise situation. Between October 22nd and 24, 1956, the leaders of France, Great Britain and Israel had a clandestine meeting in Sabre near Paris to plot their military attacks against Egypt. The essential military tactics of the attack were laid down on October 22nd October, while the detailed maneuvers were finalized the next day. On the night of 29th October, Israeli forces would execute a large scale military attack against Egyptian force with the objective of reaching the Canal Zone by the next day. On October 30, the British and French government would arrange simultaneous calls to war in fact, calling on them to suspend hostilities and pull back 10 kilometers from the Suez Channel, at which point from the nine British and French force would occupy and secure, secure every cape point along the canal to ensure free movement through the channel and all nations until the final settlement. Under the protocols of Sabres, on the day British, French, Americans and Egyptian diplomats sat down in Geneva to come up with a compromise proposal to resolve the Suez impasse. Israeli paratroopers landed on the strategically K Mitra Pass on the western side of the Sinai Peninsula. Israeli ground troops entered Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula. Although the Egyptians were aware that Israel was mobilizing its forces, the mistakenly threw the 
Israelis were preparing for an attack against Jordan. When the Israelis initiated their attack, the Egyptians retreated. On the next day, London gave an ultimatum to Egypt. Pulled back 16 kilometers from the Canal Zone to allow British troops to secure militarily the Channel Zone as per the 1954 agreement. Egypt refused the ultimatum. British warplanes began bombing targets in Cairo, Alexandria, and the surroundings of the channel, while the British French naval fleet sailed towards the Egyptian coast. Even though the end of the American electoral campaign was fast approaching, Eisenhower, at the risk of losing the support of pro-Israel voters, demanded a pullback and commanded the British French attack. On 5th November, the Soviet Union, despite being preoccupied with crushing the Hungarian Revolution, demanded that Great Britain, France and Israel halt their aggression against Egypt. Several states of the British Commonwealth of nations opposed the attack with India and Pakistan most fervidly condemning the aggression. London's Arab allies, Iraq and Jordan, also voiced their outrage. British Prime Minister either made the decision to suspend the military action at the moment when British and French troops landed ashore <coughs> for say to begin recapturing the channel. The leaders of the two great powers in Washington and Moscow simultaneously condemned it, the attack albeit for different reasons. As the Baghdad and the inhibition of Pyot say could defend themselves effectively against the attackers. On October 23rd, while the train of attack was being grown up in favor, protests against the Stalinist system were underway in Budapest. The protests would merge into a popular uprising when a revolutionary and final fight for freedom against Soviet troops. Since mid-1950s, the Kremlin had strained its position in the Middle East, especially Egypt, which resulted in two closer ties between the Egyptian government and the regime in Hungary. In April 1956, Egypt promoted minister by proxy Nate Zade to the ambassadorship in Hungary. Moreover, in spring 1956, the Egyptian cabinet began preparation for President Nasser's official visit to Moscow, Prague, and Budapest. In September 1956, the Soviet ambassador in Budapest, Yuri Andropov, explained to Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs Karol Sarka that more opportunities should be provided to the Egyptian ambassadors to meet with the ambassador of the socialist country. He believed that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs could provide assistance in this area. Andropov also talked about coordinating foreign policy steps among the friendly socialist states, but emphasized that co by copying each other was by no means desirable. Nafezade was in Budapest throughout the Hungarian Revolution. The Egyptian ambassador was likely not in touch with the representatives of the French and British diplomatic mission in Budapest after the fact. The Egyptian diplomatic representative stayed informed about the events of October, November 1956 through radio, media, the Hungarian news agency, news and perhaps from eyewitness on the street. So even from this perspective, the period Egyptian status report and diplomatic documents showed through with anti-Jewish sentiment were extremely important. The people, especially intellectuals, writers, the young and university students came to the realization that the communist system was nothing more than a tool to be used to bring about the coup at put Hungary under 
the year of Moscow. The change that occurred in Hungary on, on the last day of October, restoring the multi-party system, the gradual shifting rightward of the government, the collapse of the leadership of the Hungarian Working People's Party, led Soviet leaders to the conclusion that the Soviet Thai system was in critical danger. Therefore, military intervention and armed restoration of order were necessary. On 1st November 1956, the Nagy administration took a radical step by announcing Hungary's intention to withdraw from the Warsaw Pact and become a neutral country. This declaration reinformed the Kremlin's decision to invade Hungary. On 4th November, Soviet troops began their military attack to crush the Hungarian re Revolution and fight for freedom. Meanwhile, Moscow looked to assure Cairo <laughs> of forthcoming military aid. It is well known that on 28th of no October, at the command of the United States, France and Great Britain, the United, Security, United Nations Security Council met to discuss the ongoing events in Hungary and their context. On the question of what to do about Hungary, the British stand had clearly shifted. Until, until October of 30, London interests were best served by delaying the decision. Afterward, the opposite was true when a quick decision was of dissent. The French and British objective was to bring the Hungarian even to the world's attention by trying to downplay the significance of their own military intervention. In summary, we may conclude that the 1956 Suez War was a military failure but a political success for Nasser. Most of his airplanes Street was destroyed, the Egyptian army suffered the loss of prestige, and Israel's reputation as a fighting force grew. In the wake of the war, Britain and France started in the Middle East country to decline, while the United States improved. While the Soviet Union broadly quelled the 1956 Hungarian Revolution and fight for freedom, its prestige as a player in the Middle East signified a group which foreshadowed later confrontation in new location between the two great powers. Nasser publicly expounded the message of Arab nationalism and Egypt desired to expand its influence from the Atlantic Ocean to the Persian Gulf. For the West, this was akin to a potential loss of Nasser to the oil field of the Middle East. During the British French Israel negotiation held in February from October 22nd to 24th of October, it is likely that the ongoing events in Hungary came up, but did not influence the timing of the Israeli attack against Egypt. According to the search of the Kremlin deliberation of Hungary and outcome of Khrushchev, the decisions were not directly impacted by the Suez crisis. Rather, it is much more likely that from the end of October, the Hungarian government were unable to maintain control of events, which seemed to indicate that Hungary was moving toward implementing a multi-party system. Withdrawing from the Warsaw Pact and declaring neutrality, moreover, we awaited the Cold War rule pertaining of affairs of influence, even as in the interest of detail, the victory of great power mutually grew the European affairs of influence via the negotiation table. The 1956 Hungarian Revolution increased tension between the two sides. However, its influence on Washington and Moscow relationship was only temporary. Meanwhile, a third way was under formation, one that bypassed both sides 
the movement of non-alignment countries. Thank you for the attention. Is there any any question or comment? We we would welcome that. Okay. I I personally lived this period before I am older than all of you. I was a student uh, at that time, and I know every moment of that. Uh, history, part of history. So uh, I, I enjoyed uh, the presentation because it was a reminder of what I have seen at that time. Thank you. Uh, my question now, uh, thank you very much for... Speak, the phone. Thank you very much for the introduction. You have tried to pull parallelism uh, between what was happening here in the Middle East to what was happening on the other side of Europe. Now, uh, did you do any exercise where you can explain and draw some parallelism between what's happening now in the Middle East and what's happening in Europe? <laughs> because it might explain what's happening. I, 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 I don't think I don't think you should answer that question <laughs> because because uh, uh, history is not yet written. Yeah. <laughs> we cannot make conclusions now. It's too early. Yes. But uh, today, you know, it took 60 years to get your hands on the documentation you got yeah. to uh, prove certain facts that happened at the time. The but today, it's a little bit faster. So now we are in the age of speed. So maybe we can draw conclusions much, much faster. We don't have to wait 60 years to get those conclusions. Well, I, I, what I meant is uh, the story is not yet over. Yeah. The, we, the, the players are still on stage. So you cannot, you cannot make conclusions now. You can analyze. But the conclusions can change completely after tomorrow. Yeah. And I mean after tomorrow. <laughs> So, so, but uh, definitely, definitely, there is a parallel and there is a, a similarity in the uh, um, interaction and interrelationship of events. Uh, it has always been like this. Our history in this part of the world has always been completely related to the European history, and not only in this era, but in every every era. The, there is an integral relationship. In fact, may I may take this opportunity to say something. I have, uh, I have just been asked to join a founder group, founders group, uh, to develop a concept or a project, and, uh, and they call it, it is called the vertical, the vertical, because it goes from Finland to South Africa. If you look at the globe, you will see that every southern part of the globe is connected to its south, except this part of the world. Europe has always been turning its face to the, to across the Atlantic. Europe has always thought of the Atlantic, of America, unfortunately, for the last uh, at least 50 years. Uh, Europe now feels that it should look down south. So what we are constructing with some European uh, partners, I am not, I'm, an, I'm being invited. It is a European concept that they want to set up a, a, a some sort of uh, interaction. It's still to be modeled between Europe, Mediterranean, and, and Africa. So that we will look at this region as a block of joint interest unlike uh, the past where the relationship has been across the Atlantic. It has always been, for the last half a century, uh, Atlantic relationship. Now, I'm glad that Europe 
is realizing that they have uh, historic partners in the South um, which, wh who should be the uh, major interest <coughs> of their policy and economic interests and cultural interests, uh, much more than looking across the Atlantic, which is very far. The Mediterranean joins the two continents, Europe and, uh, and Africa. And history tells us, and geography, that this part of the globe, north and south, are destined to be future partners. I have a comment on this comment, basically. Uh, if you look at multinational companies, uh, you see that business is always one step ahead of uh, politics, let's say. If you look at the way they, they, they divide the world, they divide it into three regions. Americas, exactly. Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific. Exactly. So business is actually using that uh, kind of distribution or That's separation. Correct. And it was always a myth on how to drive the business in the middle region, which is the Europe, Middle East, Africa, because the Americas are more homogeneous and the Asia Pacific is more homogeneous. Mm -hmm. And always there was a burden or a hurdle in the middle region on how to drive the business in the southern part, mm -hmm. uh, similar to how it's driven in the northern part. Going back to history, <laughs> there is history between this vertical. There is no history in the American vertical. What is the history between the United States of America and South America? Zero. But they can work better together, I don't know. They are not, because as of today, they are, they are talking about dismantling the America's uh, co coalition. Today, 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 it's, it, no, it's, uh, it, it, actually the, the Americans have decided today that they want to reconsider the, the alliance. So, um, you're, you're eating well. Hmm? You're eating well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe we could uh, have a, a, a group picture together? Yes. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you.